I'm uh, Mary Jo Nutting, and Dave Nutting is my husband. We're the founders and the directors of Alpha Omega Institute. Um, and Brian Mariani is uh, one of the teachers on staff with us. And we have several other teachers on staff too. We're very grateful to have Brian and, and his family as part of the AOI family. And he has so much to offer and um, he will be actually doing a, a class, a six week class in astronomy starting, um, what is it, August 23rd, I think. So you'll be hearing more from him and, and about that, but uh, we wanna invite you to that. I'm gonna give you just a little bit about our background. Uh, Dave and I were taught in the public schools. We grew up in school, you know, we didn't have, we didn't have homeschool or alternatives. We were taught by the public school system and we were taught evolution in the schools. Dave did not grow up in a, in a Christian home, so he didn't have that balancing factor. I grew up in a Christian home, and I had that balancing factor, you might say, of the, of the biblical account, and I believed it, and I believed that God as creator. I believed that uh, I believed in Genesis. I believed in Jesus as my Savior, but I was very confused with this evolution issue, and it was it became very clear in high school that, you know, here, here evolution was presented as science and creation was kind of a religious belief. And so in high school, I just drew a line down the middle and I put creation in the Bible and church and on one side and I put evolution and what I thought was science on the other side of that line. And they just never met, which meant that as I was going to school, you know, I absorbed all this evolutionary teaching and I thought it was true science, like these guys that have given you the comments, Brian, you know, so many of those, that's all they've ever known is the evolution model. And that's all they've heard in school and they've been told that it's science. And so as, as I uh, looked at these things in high school, I just separated them. I, I didn't have a way to put them together. I went to a church college my first year out of high school, and they said, oh, you know, Genesis is a myth, and it was written for primitive people who couldn't understand the science of evolution, and those days aren't real days. They're periods of time, millions of years long, and somehow God used evolution as his method of creating. And I thought, okay, now that wall can come down, right? God used evolution. It seemed to make sense to me. And so I became what we might call a theistic evolutionist, believing that evolution is science and that somehow God was involved in that evolutionary process. Now, people that are truly humanistic, materialistic evolutionists don't believe God's involved in the process. They believe it's entirely naturalistic process. But there are many, many, many people who do believe that God somehow used evolution. And, and usually that is because they believe that evolution has proven science, and yet they don't want to throw the Bible out completely. And so they get into this middle ground, you might say, where, where God somehow is involved with evolution. I, I was in that area for a while. I went from the church college to public university. And of course, in the public university, all you get is evolution. And they scoff at the idea that there is a God or that God is involved at all in this process. And so, um, you know, a lot of students at that point will totally throw the Bible out of their life completely. And we have many examples of that that we could share with you of people who grew up believing, you know, they grew up in the church home or they went to church and they believe in Jesus and they believe in the Bible, but then they get to college and somehow that evolutionary teaching is overwhelms them and they end up becoming atheists like uh, Lanny Johnson, who's on our staff did. He claimed to be an atheist for over 20 years. And they finally came back to the Lord through creation ministry. But I, I praise God, I wasn't quite that logical. I managed to hang on to my faith just a bit, even though, I, even though it was compromised. And my life was not, I wasn't living according to a, a good walk with the Lord at that point in time. It was very confused. And my life was a mess, really. But I didn't throw God out. I still tried to hang on to him. And I finally graduated from Colorado State University. I had a degree to teach biology. And what could I teach? 
All I knew was evolution. So when the book taught evolution, I taught evolution too. I didn't know there was another side to the story from a scientific point of view. Uh, we went from New Mexico where we were teaching public school up into Alaska to teach at a little uh, church college in Alaska. And they didn't care if we taught evolution. The whole science department believed in evolution. And uh, so I fit right in with the rest of them. But, you know, God has a way of intervening in your life. And one day I was shopping in a little secondhand store in Alaska, and I found a little book called Evolution, The Fossils Say No by Dr. Duane Gish. I bought that book for five cents. <laughs> but that book in five cents turned our lives around. I read it from my perspective in biology, and then Dave read it from his perspective in, in geology and paleontology. And we said, this guy's either nuts or he knows something we don't know. We better start doing some research. And so we started studying things from a different perspective than what we had been given in school. And started looking at the data, started looking at the evidence ourselves. And over a period of time, we became very convinced that evolution didn't hold up scientifically, that creation was more scientific, actually, than evolution. And uh, some of your skeptic friends on Facebook might, might not agree with that, Brian, but, uh, but that's, that, that was the conclusion we came to. And as we began to see that it wasn't the evidence itself, it was the interpretation of the evidence that differed. I mean, we have the same fossils to work with as evolutionists have and same things. And so, so we're working with that kind of a background. Well, at that point in time, we were really excited to find out that the, that the science didn't contradict the Bible, but that it, that it really affirmed what the biblical account was. And we weren't trying to prove the Bible by science. What we were trying to do is to understand science in light of scripture and, and, you know, the way that they would fit together without, without uh, harming either one of them, basically, in the process. <laughs> but we had a student at that time, and his name was Jeff. He was actually lived with us for a time, and he was a great student, and he and Dave enjoyed doing things together, and they would go out hunting or fishing or hiking or something, you know, they'd talk about all kinds of things. But whenever Dave got close to anything spiritual, Jeff would just close up. And finally, one day, Jeff says, Dave, I can't buy this Jesus stuff. Dave said, why not, Jeff? He says, because evolution is a fact. That means Genesis is false. He said, if God can't get the first book of the Bible right, why would I believe anything else he had to say? That's a really good point, isn't it? I mean, if the author of the book is lying in the beginning, why would you believe anything else? And so... Uh, and we had a we had a seminar yeah, up there at our little college in Alaska. We had invited Dr. Henry Morris from the Institute for Creation Research to come and, and do a series of lectures. And Jeff came to those lectures. And at the end of time, that time, he said, if evolution isn't true, that doesn't leave much, does it? I'd better start doing some thinking. And within a couple months after that, Jeff became a believer in Jesus. Now he had a foundation. Now he could believe Genesis. He can believe that there is a God, that there is a creator. He could understand the, the uh, account of Adam and Eve and the, and the fall and the flood eventually. And so he saw that there was a reality to those things, which gave him confidence to believe in the reality of the New Testament also. And uh, what we were, what, what Dr. Morris shared with him, and then we shared more later, were, were scientific evidences and other kinds of apologetic evidences to show that the scriptures really do hold up to intense academic scrutinization. You know, it's not just, it's not just the God of the gaps. It's not just believe because you believe. There is really good evidence. At the time when, when Jeff became a believer, that's when we feel like God was calling us into a creation ministry. And we ended up coming back from Alaska um, to Western Colorado. Dave took some more classes in geology. We ended up going out to the Institute for Creation Research and got some more training and teaching there. And eventually started the Alpha Omega Institute in 1984. And we've been, we've been, teaching creation ever since, teaching, teaching the evidences, um, 
staff has grown. We're not a huge organization, but God has allowed us to speak all over this nation and in 30, 30 plus other nations, um, which is something we had never anticipated. But uh, God has opened that door up for us. And so what we want to share in this series is a, kind of a brief introduction to the creation model as as a, as a model that will encompass both science and the scripture and do justice to both of them. And so we call it Science Cries Out Creation because we believe that when you really look at the scientific evidence, it points to creation. And we look at the scriptures then of Genesis 1 through 11, laying that foundation for us. And so I just want to use this one slide today, um, and we will be reviewing that in future ones. But if you think about it, Genesis 1 and 2, those two chapters of Genesis are all about creation and design. We see evidence of design in nature. We see evidence of God's creative power that he created out of nothing, that he didn't he didn't take a, an ape and put a soul into it to become human, but it says we were created in the image of God, human beings, and so on. All the various types of animals and plants he talks about in Genesis 1 and 2. And at the end of those chapters, or at, at the end of the uh, chronological um, chapter of Genesis 1 in early Genesis 2, at the end it says, and it was very good. And so at the end of the creation time, God said, it's very good. And we see evidence of that kind of design in nature, of that intricacy of design when we look at the animals, the plants, the DNA, the, the other uh, molecular chemicals and so on that are used in, in life. We see evidence of that very good, but we also see evidence that something isn't quite right. And as we go back to scripture, we find out in Genesis 3 why things aren't quite right. We find out about this event called the fall. God had given Adam and Eve one commandment, don't eat from that one tree. And of course, like most kids or most of us, if we're given one thing to do, we all naturally have a, a rebellious tendency. And that seems like the more that we look at that, that's the more that we want to do, unfortunately. But Adam and Eve fell to those temptations that they could be as gods and knowing good and evil, experientially knowing good and evil. And, and we find out in scripture then in Genesis 3, there's, there, there's a, the account of Adam and Eve being tempted by the devil. But we also see there are seeds of the promise of the Redeemer that would come and, and would change things around in the world. Well, as we look at the world today, we see evidence of that fall. We see evidence of death and decay and, and evil and things not, not being right, uh, disease and all kinds of other things in our world and people fighting against people and broken relationships and so on. And all of that stuff can, can be understood and stem back to what we read in Genesis chapter 3. And then all the way through Genesis 3 to 5, if you read the genealogies, it says, and he died, and he died, and he died. And so we see the impact of not obeying God, of not believing and obeying God was that death came into the world through Adam's sin. Well, then what do we see happening on the earth? We see that evil multiplying and spreading throughout the earth. And God finally says, enough is enough. And he's ready to wipe out this world as a punishment for sin, as a, I think also as a cleansing, because he knew that if the world continued to go that way, human beings would be totally wiped out. There would be, there would be no humans left. And yet God's purpose was relationship with human beings. He found Noah. He says, Noah, in the scripture says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God communicated with Noah, told him to build this boat in order to save himself and his family and representatives of each of the types of animals on the earth at that point in time. And then we read of this event that we call the flood. And it's a very detailed 
description of the flood. It doesn't read like a once upon a time in a faraway land. It has names, it has dates, it has events very particularly. And so we see in scripture, we see that evidence, but then we get to the world and we look around us and we see evidence of that flood all around the world in the rock layers themselves, in the way that they were laid down, in the sedimentation that took place, and then also in the erosion and the other events after the flood. So we see scientific evidence in this world that fits and affirms this Genesis flood. After the flood, what happened? God told Noah and his family to get off the boat and people were to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, that's the same command that was given back in Genesis 1. But after the flood, the people are going, no, you know, as people multiplied on the earth, they didn't want to spread out and fill the earth. They wanted to stay together in this, in this uh, place in the Middle East and build this tower that would reach to the heavens and really, it was the idea, we can become gods ourselves. Same old temptation that was given back in Genesis 3. And so we see evidence of this Tower of Babel. We see evidence in the actual uh, confusion of languages around the world today. Uh, secular science does not have a good answer for the variety of languages. In fact, one of the... One of the uh, man that we've trained who lives in Costa Rica, he's a professional translator, and he's been studying this and, and showing this, this secular uh, ideas about the origin of languages, and, and they don't hold up. What they do find when they look at the real evidence is it fits with what we find in scripture. And so in Genesis 9 through 11, after the flood, like I like to call it Babel and beyond, we talk about the dispersion of humans and animals throughout the world. We see a commonality in the pagan religions throughout the world, and yet we see this evidence of God's truth coming through again and again and again, that these ancient people, they knew about the flood, they knew about the truth, but, but they had turned away from it. And so we will be looking at that end of things and talking about the ideas of, of origin of languages, origin of races, what we call races. We really only believe there's one race. It's the human race. We're all related. We'll show that. We'll show you how to understand that. So Genesis 1 through 11 in, in our minds is foundational to understanding the rest of scripture, but it's also foundational in understanding science. Because we see, why do things look like they're so complex and so interrelated? And we see evidence of design. But then why do we see evidence of all this bad stuff, too? And then why do we see evidence of a flood and so on? And so I believe that if you can get this simple outline in your mind, it will help to understand the rest of Scripture, but will also give you a framework within which to evaluate the scientific data that we see on the earth today. We're going to start today with Genesis 1 and 2, and we're going to be looking today at evidence of design in this wonderful world that we believe God created. Now, even if you don't believe that, even if you're a skeptic and you don't believe it, the evidence points to complexity. And you, you need to have one way or another to describe to interpret that complexity. Was it a result of random chance and accidents of mutations and natural selection and so on? Or was this complexity that we see the result of intelligence and design and creativity? We believe it was there because of the, the creativity of our creator. And we're gonna just show you some of that today. What we wanna do with this is that will give you um, maybe more more perspective to look at this whole issue of creation and evolution. So Dave, you wanna take over there? Okay, we'll do it. Thank you, Mary Jo. All right, so grand design, that's what we see. That's what Mary Jo was talking about. But we have somebody else and the skeptics that write in think, oh no, there's no design. You can't tell if something was designed. It all came about by basically blind chance working with mutations and natural selection. 
Well, I see it very differently, but I didn't always, like Mary Jo said, we used to believe in the evolutionary model that uh, eventually people could turn into uh, uh, people by a, from the zoo, you might say, that goo evolves into you by way of the zoo. That's very different, but that's what we are taught. That's what so many people are taught. The skeptics that rode in and saying that, uh, boy, you're in the horse and buggy days if you don't uh, accept evolution. Uh, uh, well, actually, I was there uh, in the horse and buggy days of accepting evolution until I finally realized that evolution does not work scientifically. So there's so many people, including some of those that rode in uh, regarding this uh, seminar, uh, they would say creation is just a religious myth, whereas evolution is science. And so that's the concept that so many people have. And I'm going to tell you today that evolution isn't science. It's a philosophy of how we got here, posing as though it were science. It is the pillar of what is called the naturalistic worldview. By naturalistic worldview, I mean this, that everything in the universe, from the very cells in our body and how we got that first cell, to the, even the origin of the universe itself, uh, all was, was and can be explained by natural processes without a God whatsoever. And so this idea of naturalism says that all, everybody has to view the world today from naturalistic viewpoints, no God is allowed. And let me demonstrate the, uh, the idea of this idea that it's um, not science, it's a philosophy. How did the universe come into being? According to the models that are taught now, it all came about by a big bang explosion. And in fact, Discover Magazine, who is one, or which is, 100% committed to the idea of evolution. I had a front page title here and then an article. Where did everything come from? And if you look at what it says right on the front cover, keep in mind, this is a magazine 100% devoted to naturalism. Here's what they say right from that box. The universe burst into something from absolutely nothing. Zero, nada. And as it got bigger, it became filled with even more stuff that came from absolutely nowhere. And then they say, how is that possible? Boy, is that a good question, isn't it? Okay. Even the young kids can say, wait a minute. Think about it. How can you have nothing exploding, number one? And how do you get everything from nothing unless God is the one who's working on it? Well. Essentially, that shows you the no-God system of naturalism, okay? Unfortunately, we're going to find out that students are being chained to this whole idea of naturalism. That's everything in the universe can be explained by only natural processes without God. So many of the people that wrote in with negative things about this uh, uh, seminar that you are looking at are chained to naturalism. They can't think out of that box whatsoever. You know, Colossians 2.8 in the Bible says, see to it. Boy, that's emphatic. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy. And I just said evolution is not <laughs> science. It's philosophy. It is a philosophy of how we got here on planet Earth. It turns out this is really important to understand. We see what's going on. This is not some side issue. If you speak to uh, students at the university campus or so many other places, they give you this. I can't believe in creation because evolution is a fact. Oh, really? It turns out the number one reason students give for rejecting the gospel is evolution. And it's also the main reason students leave the church. And that's a high percentage 
of the students from evangelical church homes. And by the way, it's not just secular people. It is also um, people in the church. Mary Jo mentioned Lanny Johnson, who was uh, came uh, came to the Lord when he was uh, nine years old in the vacation Bible school. But high school beat any faith out of him and college finished the rest of it. And so he became an atheist for about 25 years. And so also I want to warn anybody who's homeschooling, you are not exempt from it because all the friends around your kiddos are possibly trying to tell them, oh, evolution's a fact. How can you believe this creation? How can you believe the Bible? And we see a lot of people end up weakening their faith, even by friends in their churches. So they need to be prepared for what they're going to be facing so that they're not uh, taken captive. You know, I say the evidence cries out, things were created with the design. And just look at the whole universe and even the cells and go down deeper, the DNA in your body. I've had students tell me, you can't tell if something was designed. Maybe evolution could produce what you think is designed. Well, God says you can tell. <laughs> it says in Romans chapter uh, 1, verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So he says you can see it by what is made. There is a design. You can tell there is a God. Um, anyhow, they said this too. Their foolish hearts were darkened when they didn't believe it. And Romans 1, it continues, it says, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and then birds and animals and creeping things. You know, if you look at that, it sounds a little bit like evolution. Yes, idolatry, crafting images, worshiping those images, which God uh, didn't like the idolatry that was going on, but it also looks like possibly even from an evolutionary perspective. And I can tell if things were designed. Nobody's going to tell me that those rocks got to be that shape accidentally by rocks banging around in a stream bed, right? Yeah, those things are arrowheads and they look like they were crafted by somebody. Nobody else. No, no, no one's going to tell me that that painting came as a result of an explosion in a paint factory. What do you think? Is that a good explanation? Boom! Now pops this painting. Well, I know this was designed, even though I don't see the designer uh, that actually painted that, because we know oil and canvas don't naturally form together like that. All right. I can look at the living world, too, and uh, find out evidence of design. How many of you like dolphins? Yeah, usually it's almost everybody. All right. We all love those dolphins. They are amazingly designed, okay? And uh, we're going to talk a little bit by this. Here's what that magazine as 100% committed to naturalism, that you have to explain everything you see, including dolphins, by natural processes. No God involved. Um, Discover Magazine, by all rights, life in the sea should leave the dolphin baked, crushed, and sterile. This graceful mammal avoids such a fate only by slipping through the loopholes in the laws of physiology. Now, to those who aren't aware of what they're doing, they just slap a coat of paint on the problem. It looks designed, but they're going to say, uh, no, we can't accept that. We have to be chained to our philosophy of naturalism. All right. And so let's discover a magazine. Now, what? why would a dolphin be baked? Well, guess what? A dolphin is a water mammal, needs to keep warm. And it's going to swim in the cold water. What's it going to do first? First, it's going to swim over to Walmart, right? And when I get to Walmart, it's going to buy a nice 
warm coat, put it on, then swim in the warm water. Well, that's not going to work. Well, it does put on a coat, but this coat is not from Walmart. It is actually a coat of blubber, very thick blubber. And blubber, like fat, is very, very, is a good insulator, let's put it that way. A good insulator. And it'll keep this dolphin warm. But now here comes the problem. Here's why he's going to be baked. Because if it put on a Walmart coat, it could take it off. But you can't take the blubber off. <laughs> okay. And so what happens, it's such a good insulator when the dolphin expends all that energy or swims into warmer water. Now it's producing more heat and it's going to get baked inside of its uh, blubber layer. And so what is the solution? How is this coral dolphin going to survive? Well, you see that uh, fin sticking straight up? That's the dorsal fin. And that acts just like the radiator of an automobile. The blood is pumped up into that particular dorsal fin, circulates round and around, when it gets to the perfect temperature, it goes back down and what? Cools the rest of the body system. So it's more efficient than your radiator. So I say the dorsal fin of a dolphin plus all the other things tell me that the dolphins were well designed. Okay, Here's a here is a primitive uh, beetle. Wow, this little beetle lives in the Southwest United States. You might even see one, but it has a special capability of being able to mix chemicals together and produce an explosion that will shoot fiery liquids and gases into the face of an approaching frog. Now, isn't that amazing? How did that happen by accident? Can you imagine how evolution had to proceed by slow and gradual processes, changing a little bit at a time, then a little bit more at a time, over a million years, and eventually you produce that working vomitor beetle. Well, how did you get started? Well, you're going to have to have the right chemicals, first of all, aren't you? And so this smart beetle is going to go to the chemistry lab and he's going to start mixing chemicals to find the right combination. And sure enough, when you mix the chemicals together, what do you finally get? You get the right combination. Ah, perfect. Now you got a better beetle, right? Wrong. Now you've got a dead beetle. Why? because you have to have everything else working and operating at the same time. Otherwise, you're going to blow yourself up with those chemicals. And so you have to have not only the chemicals, the storage compartments for those chemicals, the mixing chambers, the explosion chambers, and several sets of valves, and also the brains of when to use it and when not to use it. Otherwise, if you shoot your cannon, a potential Mrs. Beetle, you're not going to get very far either, are you? All right. So we see all things working together. It tells me it's a design system. Okay. Well, anyhow, that's just one of God's amazing creatures. How about the sea anemone? Well, this one's closed up, but this one's actually hunting. And you'll find out when a f the fish comes along, hits it the end of this tentacle, a missile is fired and the sea anemone gets a dinner. And yeah, at the end of every one of tentacles is this poison missile system. There's a trigger and a trap door. And not only that, the fish hits that, it opens. This missile is tipped with poison and it's spring loaded and bam, the sea anemone gets that little fish. Pretty unique system, isn't it? Now, how would you like to eat one of those guys? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, but they're, no, not with all those poison darts going off in your stomach. You wouldn't want that. Well, the sea slug is another creature, and it actually eats the sea anemone, poison darts and all. 
All right. And we've dramatized it a little bit. He's sneaking up on him, right? <laughs> but anyhow, he eats the entire sea anemone. Everything is digested except for those poison dart missiles. So what's he going to do with them? Well, notice the sea slug has tentacles of his own, but he has no ability to manufacture his own poison system. So he takes those poison darts that are rattling around in his stomach, transports them to the end of his own tentacles. Once put in place, first fish comes along, hits that trigger, bam, this missile fires again. And you say, wow, this is a creature that pirates another's missile system and uses it for its own. Now you have complex things like tentacles and poison missiles that don't happen by accident, plus some kind of a complex arrangement between different animals in the animal kingdom. How many of you watched a uh, woodpecker in action? You can hear them frequently like that, right? So fun to hear them, watch them is even better. They're like living jackhammers, but they hit their head against the tree with such a force that if they didn't have special design features, their beak would fold up like an accordion. And not only that, their eyeballs would pop out of their head. What happens here? Well, it turns out there's a special film that closes down over its eye every time he hits his head against a tree. It keeps the wood chips out and keeps the eyeballs in. Very important design feature. And there's a special cartilage between the beak and the skull. And that keeps him from scrambling his brains like scrambled eggs, right? And it also keeps him from folding his beak up like an accordion. Some of you might say, well, that's a dumb bird hitting his head against a tree. Why is he doing that? Well, he's hungry. I'll guess some of you do strange things when you're really hungry too, huh? But this guy, hears a bug on the inside of the bark of this tree. It's usually getting going to be a dead tree, but... Uh, but he's going after it. He hears it. He's going to drill a hole down into the tunnels that these bugs have formed inside of that bark of that tree. And he will then scoop up those bugs. And guess what? He has a good meal. Well, wait a minute. Hold on. Bugs aren't really stupid. Nope. They're not just a bug. They're, they're not stupid. They're smart. And, uh, and so he hears this thing coming and would escape down one of its tunnels, except for a special feature. It's the long tongue of the woodpecker. <laughs> this tongue is about four and a half times longer than his skull. And he slaps it down in that hole. There are sticky barbules on the end, gets that bug, whoop, puts it up in his mouth. And you say, wow, that's pretty unique. But there are, there's special glue that holds it on the tongue. And wait a minute. Once you put the tongue back in your mouth, how are you going to get the bug off of it? Imagine that. This uses wing to pull it off. <laughs> it's as Lanny of our children's uh, ministry team to do a lot of va vacation Bible school says he has special spit <laughs> and that dissolves that glue instantaneously. Well, now that's great. But here's another problem with a tongue that long. What do you do with it? You see this woodpecker doesn't have a shirt pocket to put it in. What happens if you would um, leave it hang out when he's pecking a hole in the tree. I mean, it's too long for his mouth. So if he leaves it hang out, he's going to chop it right in half, isn't he? Ooh, that's got to hurt. Hmm. He doesn't wrap it around his neck, does he? Well, he does something a little different. The tongue fits into a special storage compartment that comes out of the back of the mouth, wraps around the skull, and attaches up here in the beak region. When he needs it, it comes out. It's also stretchy like in a rubber band. There are muscles that pull it clear down into the chest cavity. Unique storage compartment, isn't it? Now, if evolution is true, that's going to produce this bird, whether it be a flicker or a woodpecker, 
Which came first, the long tongue or the storage compartment? Ah, we got a problem there. Both of them have to be there at the very same time. If you want to hear Lanny talk about it, uh, go to our uh, website, discovercreation.org. Go to the children's uh, page and you'll be able to see him talk about this and show you the pictures. Giraffes are amazingly uh, uh, designed creatures as well. Do you like giraffes? I'd like to have one as a pet, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but interesting thing about a giraffe is it needs to think, it needs blood supply to the brain. And uh, so that means it's got to pump that blood all the way from the heart up to the brain. Well, you, your body needs to do the same thing and your pump, the heart, is about the size of your fist. It doesn't have that far to pump the blood, okay? And so, kaboom. so your heart is going kaboom, kaboom. Love dub, love da, love God, love, <laughs> love God. Is that what your heart is doing? I hope so. But here, this particular giraffe, that's a long ways to pump it. So its pump is three and a half feet long almost. Now, some of them might be two and a half. But it turns out that when your heart's going love dub, love God, this one's going kaboom, kaboom. That's a lot of blood pressure in there, right? Now, what happens when that giraffe bends down to take a drink of water? Now you have that blood pressure as well, plus uh, gravity acting on that blood. And this poor giraffe should blow his brains right out of his ears with all that blood pressure. But that doesn't happen. The reason? It's because there's a special... Uh, type of neck muscles that act as valves that constrict that flow of blood and there's a spongy mass of material that absorbs that last flow so this poor uh, giraffe doesn't blow his brains out. It's pretty neat, isn't it? But there's another problem. How many have stood up too fast and got dizzy? Whoa. We all do. All right. Well, what happens if the giraffe hears a lion coming after him, all right? It's going to throw his head up in the air, boom, take off running. No, it'd get dizzy and fall over and become lion meat. No, but it doesn't because those valves open as quickly as they shut down, and that spongy mass of material releases the blood that's so necessary into the brain in a very controlled way, and that keeps them safe. Everything of that giraffe looks like it's designed. And what are we looking at design with? Our eyes. Do you realize how designed your eyes are? Yeah, just, just, just take your eye out for a little bit and take a look at it. No, 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 don't do that. <laughs> yeah, but if you looked at your eye, you would see all of the different muscles of the eyes working in uh, unison together. And But if you look a little bit closer, you find out even the cornea of the eye is so well designed that I have a... Uh, an eye surgeon that I know of in Costa Rica that's learning how to do these creation programs so he can do it down there, but he can spend an hour just on this little tiny thing in front of your eye called the cornea. And when you see that, whoa, wait a minute, it's so well designed. But now, what would the skeptic say? What kind of answer would an evolutionist provide? Who is committed to the idea of or philosophy of naturalism? What would that person have to say? Well, they'll have to find fault with it and say, oh, I don't think it's design. In fact, Dr. Richard Dawkins, who's heading up the atheists, those are the ones that don't believe in God, and uh, has influenced a lot of the people that wrote in and thinking they were kind of crazy to believe in creation, all right? But they, they've been influenced. Dr. Richard Dawkins calls this design absurd design. I can do better, he says. I can design it better. So therefore, there can't be a God who designed it in the first place. Well, that sounds like a great answer, doesn't it? Except for one thing. If Richard Dawkins walked outside with his design, with the eye design, like he said on a bright day, 
lots of sunshine, he would be blind in about two hours because the way he designed it eliminates a piece between the cornea and the back of the eye that is uh, a UV protector. And uh, that he says if that thing was put off to the side, we'd be able to see better. He's right, but that's a half truth. We might be able to see better for a little bit, but we would go blind without it. And so I think God knew what he was doing with that eye. Here's Dr. Richard Dawkins again. The, he says this, do you realize you breathe air through the very same tube that you swallow food through? Well, you could choke to death. And he calls this supposed design, he calls it supposed, the height of stupidity. <laughs> How would you like to go up to God and tell God, your, your design is stupid. It's the height of stupidity, in fact. Right? Uh, yeah, right. I don't think that would go over very well. <laughs> uh, so, wait a minute. Yeah, it is true that you breathe through the same tube that you uh, swallow food with. So, yes, you could choke to death. But how many listening to me today have choked to death this morning? None. <laughs> okay. Something yeah. is working, right? Something is working. And so, uh, hmm. <laughs> did you really choke to death today? Okay. <laughs> nope. It is really working. Anyhow, but I look at this as engineered system, superbly engineered. You've got a lot of functions going on in one small compartment. You know, uh, I call that a, uh, let's just call it a uh, Swiss knife type of uh, construction. So many things, so many tools all working together. Do you realize that it makes speech possible? I can't even be talking today without the design being here. And it helps you cough up food if you ever get something stuck because you have that lung capacity to push it out. How would Richard Dawkins get a piece of food out if he uh, swallowed it and doesn't have all this lung capacity and this tube working together simultaneously? I guess you would send a fish hook down, reel it up, right? Then he'd get that piece. Or maybe you'd take a big plunger, boom, 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 and push that food down. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, and where would Richard Dawkins put other tubes? You get about one here at the top of the head, or where, where would he put it? You see, God knows what he's doing. Okay, God does. All of this is superbly engineered like a Swiss Army knife. You know, my computer is amazingly designed. Yeah. So is the one you have at home that you're watching this with. Okay. It's amazingly designed. It really is. But your brains are better than your computers. And you say, really? Yep. It works faster, et cetera. And it's uh, even on a miniature scale, it would. Uh, brain is much better than my computer. A lot of people don't understand, but there are so many connections in your brain. A single brain has more switches than all the computers and routers and internet connections on the face of planet Earth. Okay, the total number of these connections and synapses in a brain roughly equal the number of stars in 1,000. 500 Milky Way galaxies. How many stars is that? A bunch. <laughs> Let's just say a bunch, right? That's a lot of stars. And to think that the brain just happened by accidents of evolution. Does that make sense? Which is better science? It's a good question. Here's what naturalism has to say. Perhaps, I like that word perhaps, Guess what? It's not scientific. <laughs> Perhaps an early cell billions of years ago developed a sensitivity to other cells. Oh, then it is on. Then it is conceivable 
it would be on its way to becoming a human brain. Yeah, conceivable. Uh huh. That's not a scientific term either. Well, is it conceivable? Well, to steal a line out of a famous movie that some of you have probably seen, it's inconceivable. Ever seen Princess Bride? <laughs> if you don't, it's a great movie to watch. Okay, junk DNA. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. How many have heard that the DNA in your body is junk left over from millions of years of evolutionary development? See, evolution would predict that. You know why? Because it has to have it that way. And so it becomes a fact in the textbook that 95% of the DNA in your body is junk left over from all this millions of years of evolution. Well, it turns out that was totally false. Okay, your DNA is a computer system and it's not junk. You're going to find it's not only today, but also in what Mary Jo will talk about as well. But DNA is not junk. You know, it turns out that the uh, DNA that codes for the color of your hair, the color of eyes, so many things in your body systems um, is the most complex information storage mechanism in the known universe. And that is according to scientist Dr. Robert Carter. And uh, he has a video that we actually sell here at AOI called the High Tech Cell. And you can get that thing and sell for like ten dollars. And in that video, he says the genome, the DNA, etc., is a multi-dimensional operating system for an ultra ultra complex biological computer. How would you like your computer to be able to fix itself? The DNA does. Okay, that's one big step above our computers. It has built-in error corrections, and it can actually change its codes. It modifies them for specific uh, events. Oh, wow, there is so much uh, complexity in the DNA. And you might want to get that cell or that particular high-tech cell video. It's not an easy one. It's for the uh, more advanced students, okay? Well, I can talk about all of these things that I've mentioned so far. Do you know what the skeptics would say about those? Every one of the arguments they're not willing to accept because they are chained to naturalism. They will say, we can imagine how mutations, which are nothing but accidents, maybe a, a copy error in the DNA or something like that, how mutations working with the survival of the fittest, it's called natural selection, it's acting over millions of years. It might refine our systems or even produce them. Again, a couple of words that are not scientific. The word imagine. We can imagine. Uh, that's just naturalism. Slapping a coat of paint over all of this stuff. And might refine. Well, they don't know that. It's just a hope of naturalism. That, that you can produce everything by natural processes of evolution. All right, and so um, let, let's continue here. Mary Jo is going to talk, uh, I think, more tomorrow about uh, biology and how that mutation of natural selection just doesn't work. And that's not at 7.30 to uh, uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow. That'll be at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. That's what Mary Jo is going to do. And so which one of those items that you see there in the picture was not designed? Was it the hummingbird? If you ever saw a hummingbird in flight, you'll understand that's much more intric intricate flight than the uh, that airplane. And guess what? The dragonfly also has intricate flight. And the dragonfly can actually lift more times its body weight than the airplane can do so. Wow. So I say if I had to make a choice, which one is superior? Well, God's design is superior to man's design, right? And uh, if you want to listen or read more about it, there's a book by uh, uh, Burgess 
um, inspiration from creation, it's called. He says that the dragonfly is kind of like a submarine in the larval stage, but it's also amphibious. It can go out on land too. Uh, so it's an amphibious vehicle that climbs out on land, out of the water. And once it does it, it turns into a helicopter without any fa factory or group of mechanics to help it along. <laughs> so I think that's really saying something that uh, looks like God's design really works. All right. In fact, we've been studying the uh, wing and the mechanism of a uh, dragonfly to figure out how to build a better aircraft. And I'm making a hovercraft or maybe even little uh, robotic type of uh, cameras that can fly. Well, a number of years ago, Darwin wrote a book called, excuse me, Darwin. <laughs> well, Darwin wrote The Origin of Species where he thought evolution could produce everything. Well, Michael Bay, he wrote a book, Darwin's Black Box. It's called The Biochemical Challenge to Evolution. And he used a concept called irreducible complexity. There are certain things that you see in the living world that absolutely cannot be explained by slow and gradual processes. Like, for instance, the bombardier beetle getting all the chemicals all working together, having an apparatus at exactly the same time. He called that a mousetrap system or irreducible complexity. So what does he mean by that? You see that mousetrap? Can you eliminate any one piece of that mousetrap and have it be a working mousetrap? Nope. Everyone is necessary, including the catch, the spring, Wow, all it needs is a mouse, <laughs> okay? Yeah, but you can't eliminate any piece, even the block of wood, you can't eliminate huh. and have a working mousetrap. Well, we see things like that in our body. Um, how many of you out there got a cut in the last 100 years? Yeah, we did, huh? We got a cut and we know it. And the reason we didn't die is because we have a special way to keep that blood from flowing when we get a cut. And that's called our blood clotting system. And what happens, there's a substance in your blood that's going to make a nice net across your blood vessel that keeps the red blood cells from passing by. It'll keep you from dying. Okay, that little net is made by long fibrous molecules uh, called fibrin. And the fibrin is going to produce your blood clot. But I want you to think about it. What happens if you have a bunch of fibrin in your blood right now? Any ideas? You're dead. <laughs> That's it. It's going to make blood clots throughout your entire system. And so fibrin better not exist as fibrin, otherwise you're going to get all plugged up in your in your veins, etc. Hmm. So fibrin exists in an inactive form called fibrinogen. Oh, that's a big word, but that just means it needs to be tur it turns needs to be turned on in order for you to get a blood clot when you get a cut. But wait a minute, what turns on the fibrinogen so you don't die of bleeding? Well, it's a substance in the second word down there called thrombin. It turns on the fibrinogen, makes fibrin. Ah, you got a blood, blood clot. Now you can live. But what happens if you have a bunch of thrombin in your blood right now? You're dead again. Because <laughs> it turns on all the fibrinogen you die of the blood clots. So thrombin exists as an in, in an inactive form called prothrombin. Well, to make it a little shorter, every one of these chemicals listed, plus a whole bunch more, all have to be there, but all have to be activated or turned on. The entire system works together or none of it works at all. That's a blood clot system. That is a mousetrap system. Okay. And uh, so how in the world did evolution ever produce that? You eliminate one of those pieces, you're dead, right? 
and you have to have the system available to turn things on and off. Well, how do you even turn one of these systems on? Now, don't worry about all the big names, etc. But keep in mind that in order to go from a inactive, say, steward factor, which will activate thrombin, in order to do it, you have a whole bunch of other chemicals too, all working together in sequence. And if you eliminate one of those pieces, you're dead. Okay, so what are we talking about? We're talking about a very complex system with one thing having to happen here. Then it turns on this thing. Then this happens. Then this happens. Then this happens. It's kind of like the cartoon where uh, the Roadrunner is being chased by Wiley e. Coyote, right? And uh, Roadrunner hits a little trigger, and it's all of a sudden there's something that clicks this on, something rolls down, flips this switch, flips this little twig, and it covers this and this thing. And maybe 20 steps down the road or 100 steps down the road, the poor old coyote gets a huge ball dropped on top of him. He's flat as a pancake. Okay. That's called a Rudy Gold machine. Uh, in, but all of that speaks of creation when I looked at something like this. Well, Scientific Americans gave an answer to that. They said, well, perhaps we can imagine. And unfortunately, those are not scientific terms, okay? And their argument was actually answered again by a pretty solid creationist scientist uh, who showed them all that stuff that didn't work. Clear back in 1984, 85, Michael Denton, Dr. Denton, wrote a book called Evolution of Theory in Crisis. In that, he described the cell as a city. Now, I want you to look at the end of your finger. And do you realize you have billions of cells in there? You can't even count them. You might be able to see some of them with a uh, microscope. But that each one of those city, if you were to uh, cells like a city, if you were to expand that cell, the size of a city, you would walk in it and you would find your world, of, you would self, find yourself in a world of extreme complexity, according to Dr. Denton. Okay? Extreme complexity. You would find out there's chemical factories in the computer processing center. Uh, there are sewer, sewer system, UPS delivery that's going on inside there. There are guards on the gate. And they knew that about a cell clear back in 1984 that this is not simple. And yet, kiddos, if you pick up a science textbook, what are you going to be taught? Let's study the simple cell. Guess what? There's no such thing as a simple cell. It's all extremely complex. Again, look at the end of your finger again. Inside of each of those billions of cells, you have many types of electric motors in there. There are more motors inside, inside the cells of your little finger than there are electric motors and gasoline engines in the entire known world. Did you know that? That's a bunch, a bunch of those things, okay? And uh, let's just talk about one, just one of the 20,000 different types of motors that you have, okay? And this is the one that's gonna give you energy so you can keep your eyes open to listen to this guy talk about it, right? It's going to give you energy. And uh, that's very important for you to also run around and do things that you want to do, ride a bike, <clears throat> go shopping, all this good stuff. All righty. But what happens is this is a energy producing machine. When you look at the end of your finger, whoa, every one of your billions of cells has one of those. Okay. And it's going to be producing energy for you. 
And in order to do it, it's working only on little tiny things called proteins and even tinier uh, molecules besides that. <clears throat> Uh, according to some of the people who studied this, these machines in the end of your little finger are some of the most complex things in the entire known universe. All right, uh, we'll go into one, but let's, how are we gonna make that machine? You have to understand the DNA is a long molecule, okay? It's a computer program. If you read it, it reads like a computer program, but it's multidimensional. Uh, but you take one DNA molecule inside that cell that you can't even see with your naked eye, and you would stretch out that DNA molecule, and it's finer than a hair, it would be three feet long. But it's tightly packed within the nucleus of that of that cell and so first of all you, you got to get it unpacked okay then you've got to split it or unzip it until you get to the right section that's going to give you the right to be able to make this machine okay so you have to have unwinding machines splitting machines but you don't want to use the original you've got to copy it take a picture of it and then send that picture and a piece of that picture on to a different part of the cell to via UPS. Okay, so you got to call UPS. It's got to take that and then take it into one of those little polka dots. See those little polka dots on that blob there? Hmm. Those are called ribosomes. And what they're going to do is take that section of the DNA and it's going to make a protein. And I want you to think of a protein being a long bead of strings. Got that pictured? Anybody wearing a necklace of beads? Think about a necklace of beads. That's a protein. That necklace of beads could have hundreds of beads, but it could also have thousands of beads on it. Thousands of beads to make up that protein. And so we're going to look at that and say, how is that possible it happened? And so what happens is that computer program goes into one of those little polka dots and comes out as that long string. And I should show little bees on there. And that's a protein. But it's still not going to work. So that protein has to be transported by UPS into a folding machine. And that has to be folded to exactly the right shape. Okay, perfect shape. If you don't get the right beads, guess what? It won't work. If it's not folded to the right shape, it's not gonna work. But once you get it folded, then you call UPS again, okay? Because it, it has to take this thing to the other side of the cell. And that's another machine. It's called the UPS. <laughs> or KTM, if you want to call it. And it's going to be running down. Wait a minute, what is that? That looks like a highway. Do you realize you have highways in your cells? They're called microtubules. And who, you know, Darwin thought a cell was nothing but a blob of jello-like stuff. But then they found out how complex it was. And this UPS guy, is gonna run down that highway at about 1,200 miles per hour if you were running that, okay? So you better hope the police isn't clocking you. All right, so it's gonna go to the other side of the cell. It turns out the reason why it's needed is these little particles are so small, so tiny, but the cell is large compared to these. You have to have those highways. And you have to have these high-speed transport machines to get them over there. Well, Howard Berg from Harvard University calls it one of the most efficient machines in the universe. I don't. I know he hasn't looked at every machine, but uh, but they're efficient, aren't they? And uh, what happens is the um, 
that little machine, there are 30 different proteins, 30 of them, that are going to get together and make gears. They're going to grind and out pops the energy that you need. Okay, now I know that was simplified, but don't worry about it. I just want you to understand that when you look at that, what's going on inside the cell, whether you're looking at the computer program called DNA that codes for all this or all of the different steps, everything in there looks like it's created by God. All right. And that motor that you're, this protein is going to be one of 30 of, spins at 9,000 9, revolutions per minute. That's fast. Okay. And that's why it's so efficient. All right. All right. Well, Richard Dawkins says, well, you know, he said it before. This is redundant. There are four different ways you can get the same bead. What Richard Dawkins didn't know is remember that uh, folding machine? All four of those different uh, things that he says is redundant or wasteful is going to tell you how much timing is needed to fold it precisely. And so Richard Dawkins is wrong again in this one. And uh, so modern uh, uh, journals have been saying how important that is, how it is actually uh, enables all this. So is it junk DNA? No, it looks designed. Okay. Another article came out, icr.org, a human genome's 20th anniversary, where they finally found out junk DNA hits the trash. They're now considered it was junk. Mary Jo, years ago, when they started talking about junk DNA, said, oh, no, no junk. It all looks designed. It looks designed. No junk and she predicted if you study it more you're going to find a use for it and sure enough they have found the use for it now all right and uh, you'll hear her talk just a little bit about that tomorrow do you understand how much faith it takes to even make one protein which is that string of beads how much faith it takes to make that by accident i did a calculation on it one time and showed it to my college statistics class I was teaching. And I showed the probability of evolving one protein was one in the number 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, times 10 260 times. Um, and I really, uh, Melissa, what's your favorite color? Uh, since you're muted, I think you said blue. Purple. Purple. All right. Let's suppose you were younger than your daughters, okay? And you had this favorite purple marble. In fact, you love that marble. It was the only one like it ever made, okay? And you'd be seen walking around the house with your purple marble saying, I love my purple marble. I love it. And at night, you would hide it under your pillow, right? So nobody would take it. Mm -hmm. She still does, doesn't she? <laughs> okay. Oh, but I get mean. I understand about this purple marble. And I sneak into her room some night and I steal that purple marble. <laughs> and then I fill up the entire known universe with green marbles. All right. And then uh, the next morning, I come back and say, Aha, I hear your marble. It's, uh, you know, I filled up the entire known universe, right? And that would take only 10 to the 80 times, 10 times, 10, 84 times marbles to fill up the entire known universe. You can do mathematics so if you want. Okay. Can you imagine that? If we can imagine that. And I put your mom into a spaceship. And I send her out as far as she wants, uh, any direction she wants to go, as far as she wants to go, blindfolded, no fair print about it, Melissa. What's the chance she's going to find that purple marble? Oh, she's so lucky. She finds it the first time, right? Behind some galaxy over there. And I get mad. I hide it again, and she finds it again, and I hide it again, and she finds it. <laughs> If she could do that three times in a row, 
that would be 100 million times easier than making that one very simple protein. Wow. <laughs> Incredible. I mentioned that in my university statistics class I was teaching. Bless and I, I told the students, I don't know what they teach you about these kind of odds in uh, biology and statistics. We call that zero. Guess what? That was five minutes before I heard from the department chairman. He said, I understand you're preaching religion in the classroom. It turns out, no, it's not religion. It's not religion at all. And I showed him exactly what I told the students. I'm just happy to do that. <laughs> and uh, I said, is that religion? She says, well, no. But this, this creation evolution stuff is a touchy subject here at this university. You had better drop it. I didn't. And that's why I can go around the country teaching on creation. Good for okay. you. Praise the Lord there. Huh? Yeah. Yet it takes DNA to make proteins and proteins to make DNA. Which one came first, right? And look, think about that ribosome that makes and codes that, takes that computer program and makes that specific protein. Like an assembly plant. Or maybe what are you doing to the players? Think about it. Yeah. Wow. And then it takes 300 proteins to code for one protein. So all of a sudden the plot thickens, doesn't it? It just tells you the odds is insurmountable. Yeah. All right. Well, that wasn't even a cell. And an atheist and an agnostic decided to <laughs> find out what's the probability of a cell. And they figured out it was one chance in 10 to the 40,000th power, which is 10 times itself, 40,000 times. And they said it was more likely for a tornado to sweep, sweep through a junkyard and produce from the parts in the junkyard a Boeing 747. Yeah. Wow. Well, what do these guys say? Sir Fred Hoyle and Rick Warren were saying, what did they say? There must be a God quoted in the newspapers. So did they run out and buy a Bible to find out about that God? The answer is no. The answer they said, we are still looking for a way around our conclusions. Why? Because they're chained to the idea of naturalism. Okay. Dr. Scott Todd said it this way, even if all the evidence, all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis or idea is excluded from science because it is not naturalistic. And so if you kids go to public school, guess what you're going to hear? Only naturalism. And you're going to be put in a box and say, you can't come out. You can only believe and think as a naturalistic scientist. Okay. We're going to hear that. You're going to be chained to this whole idea. And unfortunately, that's the way it is, right? Um, that's why I say evolution is not science. It's a philosophy. And it's posing as though it were science right there. And what did Colossians 2a tell us? Don't be taken captive through philosophy. So that's why we're doing these seminars, right? There are so many scientific articles coming out these days showing the tremendous design, etc. It's a great day to be a Bible believing creationist. It really is. There's so much there. But it's a better day to find out who that creator is. Okay. When you look at the creation, what do you see? God is a, is an artist, isn't he? He loves beauty. All right. Not only in the flowers, but in the animals and the birds that he's created, right? We see intense beauty all over. Look at the butterflies. You see intense beauty, don't you? And uh, not only that, when you look with a microscope and a scanning electron microscope, which is even more powerful, you find out what all the complexity is going on inside the cell. And that tells me when you look in a new detail at our creation, that God is interested in the details of his creation. That means he's interested in us, right? He's interested in all of us. All right. But we turn our telescopes out into space. What do we see? Even more complexity. Great artwork. Great beauty. Great design. And uh, that means God is a God of the big picture, too. 
You know, one thing about the scripture tells us in Psalm 147, that God numbers the stars, calls them all by name. What does that tell you? He is powerful, right? But, you know, I love the verse right next to this one. Verse 3. This is a powerful God, but listen what he says. God, this God, heals the brokenhearted and binds up all their wounds. You can't go through this life without having wounds, can you? There are things, yeah. Wow. But wait a minute. The God of the universe who created that universe is powerful enough to call all those stars by name. Then he's powerful enough to work in your hearts and your lives. That's the kind of God I wish to serve. That is a God who's worthy of our praise, okay? And I look out there and I see the evidence. True, true science says God is the creator God, okay? That's what he is. You can believe the Bible. God created. Things happened. He has a grand sign. He did not. He did not let it go by accident, did he? So that's why this first session, science cries out creation 100%, right? 100%. We can see that. That's the first session. If um, Make sure you sign up for our newsletter, uh, Think and Believe. All right? Make sure you do that, okay? And, uh, and uh, oh, look at that. We find out you have different uh, uh, things. You can go to our website to find out about uh, some of these articles, too, like uh, how not to use pepper spray from my personal experience. <laughs> all right uh yeah but anyhow or what about all the god's big book of animals so many design features uh that you can find in our newsletter too and go to our website you'll see it uh on our website you can order it as well we have family camps too uh where uh, we take uh people to see the design in costa rica That's what a wonderful spot to see amazingly designed things and so that's a whew, that's a like a ten day tour of Costa Rica, amazing tour. Or you can come to our Yellowstone National Park creation tour. You know, um, August twenty sixth to thirty one is our first one. Then we have a second one uh, for others that uh, September two through six. And so you can choose your week, and you're going to see amazing things at Yellowstone. And um, uh, we love those uh, those particular ones. So go to our website, look at the uh, different things you can see in there, find out about our uh, Yellowstone tours and other tours, uh, uh, etc. And uh, while you're there, you can uh, say, hey, I like what AOI does. And you might even consider the possibilities of, of the don donations to AOI. If you want to sign up for one of these things, uh, go to discovercreation.org and uh, or call the office uh, probably tomorrow would be the best time to call, tomorrow through Friday. And uh, there's the phone number, 523-9943, area code 970. Okay, Mary Jo, you're, you get to take it from here. Anybody have any questions? questions we covered everything no i don't think you covered it nah. all righty so what is the best evidence let me ask you what's the best evidence you've heard you think for evolution anybody have an idea go ahead melissa oh um i guess that we we look like apes. Our skulls are similar in design. Oh, similar design. Because I was looking at the mm -hmm. three of you earlier. You did not look like you came from apes. <laughs> you look like magnificent creatures of our Creator God. <laughs> okay. Yes. <laughs> yep. That is so a, a very common argument, though, that there's so many similarities between apes and humans that that proves we have common ancestry. And we'll be looking yeah. at that argument tomorrow. So come on tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> 
tomorrow morning at we'll 10 talk o'clock. about that whole idea of similarity just because two things are similar does that mean they're related not necessarily. i don't think so i don't nope. think so <laughs> you could have two little girls with long blonde hair that look and blue eyes does that mean they're necessarily from the same parents yeah. not necessarily right they might be friends <clears throat> both human beings obviously but not necessarily related by by close ancestry anyway right you have a soccer ball and a uh and a basketball does that mean <laughs> the basketball evolved from the soccer ball or the soccer ball evolved from the basketball or does it mean they're both balls and they're used for similar purposes right yeah. so we'll talk more about that tomorrow uh -huh. <clears throat> great yeah and there's a resource for you that we have here talking about the latest on supposed human evolution and i'll show yeah. you why human evolution does not work okay <laughs>